Okay, onward. We're going to have a change of scenery. Um, it would be absurd to host a conference at the British Medical Association and not tap into the perspective on better never stops from someone within that uh, profession. So it is with great pleasure, and I have a slide here to um, introduce him. Um, <laughs> for those of you who know me, I didn't do that. <laughs> you laughed a little bit too quickly, Tom. Um, uh, now, but basically, welcome to Adrian. Um, and basically, when Adrian and I were sort of uh, first, first talking about this, um, Adrian was talking about he has um, a passion for indoor rowing. I hope you don't mind me sharing this, Adrian. And Adrian was saying that uh, he's indeed it competes at, uh, he does a lot of indoor, uh, indoor ergs in the British National Championships are next month, I believe. And so we were talking about that. And, uh, and then we then talked about the, um, uh, this, this conference and uh, getting uh, Adrian to come along and present. He said, OK, I'll come on one condition. He said, I get to meet Greg Searle. So, because uh, I need to take off some of my personal base. Anyway, so we managed to set that up, and, and here we are. And when I was, uh, we was, I had some, Adrian is one of the um, leading uh, cardio, cardiac thoracic surgeons in the UK. And I actually said to me, Adrian, I've got a bit of paper here which says uh, you are the leading heart surgeon in the UK. And Adrian said, well, Austin, that's, that's very modestly. He said, that's not for me to say. Uh, however, I am very competitive. Uh, and he said, you know, over the years, he said, I, I tend to be top three, top four in terms of the number of cases, the number of operations um, that I conduct. And this was a conversation a couple of weeks ago. And I said to him, um, so what's your week been like? Uh, and he said, um, oh, well, OK, pretty good. He said, uh, for example, I've done uh, eight heart operations this week. And bearing in mind, this was Wednesday lunchtime. <laughs> it suggests that this man... Um, uh, is, is a, a massive contributor. And uh, by the way, I did just check that those eight operations were needed and that he wasn't just randomly, <laughs> you know, uh, pulling people off the high street saying, you need heart surgery, you know. Uh, um, but anyway, Adrian, I am uh, very grateful for you to come along. And because the other thing Adrian will talk about is his perspective on teamship, his perspective on development. He, um, he may share with you that he has put in some clinical protocols which are deemed best practice and have been rolled out across the world because, as he says, his profession also has to raise its game. So on that note, a warm welcome for Adrian Levine. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name's Adrian Levine. I'm a life-saving heart surgeon. I haven't got a book to sell, but if you want outstanding private cardiac surgery, I'm the man. <laughs> I'd like to dedicate this talk to my father, who for more reasons than, than one is the reason I'm here. Heart surgery. You all see it. You watch it on TV. You read about it on the internet. You listen to it on the radio. You see it in the newspapers. Most of you feel that you could have a good go at doing a set of coronary <laughs> artery bypass grafts. I'd put it to you, you probably couldn't. But there is one thing that you all do know. You all do know what success is and what failure is in my game. That's success. That man there has got a little scar down his chest. Nine weeks before that was taken, he was looking, well, the technical term we use in British cardiac surgery is a bit deadish, on the coronary care unit. He'd had a heart attack, he wasn't at his best. I operated on him and Eight weeks, nine weeks later, he's halfway up the Andes. Christ knows why he's wearing a bow tie and a cigar. That's success. That's failure. Anyone have any idea what that means? OK, right. The average human being around here is probably about 80 kilos. When you cremate an 80 kilo person, you will get their ashes into a cigar box. 70% of people who die in the UK hospital will be cremated. So, failure is leaving hospital in a cigar box. How do we measure then? What simple metric can we use to describe how well we do? Well, probably the simplest one is this, the mortality. It's the number of cigar boxes divided by the number of people that we operate on. Now, this is my feel-good slide here. This shows the t mortality for all cardiac surgery in the UK over the last 10 years or so. Now, 
We're talking about somewhere over 35,000 operations year in, year out. And it demonstrated at the beginning of the last decade, we were running at about 4% operative mortality. Now, 10 years later, we're down at 3%. Everyone goes, hmm, that doesn't seem much. But in my world, that's called statistically significant. The other way of looking at it is this. There are probably 300 odd people here, 250 odd people here. I look at it this way. I do 250 to 300 operations a year. One table of you will die every year. Perhaps due to me, perhaps due to other factors, but that's what it equates to. But it's got better. It's got better despite of the patients. When I first learnt my trade 20, 25 years ago, this was what I operated on. Look at him. He doesn't look that bad, does he? Tired businessman. A little bit too much of the corporate lunch. Thinking about the 1830 going home to Seven Oaks to see the wife and kids. He's in his early 50s. And really, the only thing he has wrong with him is his heart. Nothing much else. Scroll on now, 2012. This is more what I'm operating on. Slightly different here. She's female. That isn't a good start in my game. We know that females have a 20% higher chance of dying than males. She's elderly. This lady here is in her mid-80s. My average age of a valve replacement is 84. She's sick. How can we tell she's sick? Well, she's got one of those really lovely Zimmer frames. And as well as that, and a very interesting fact, she's poor. How do we know she's poor? Well, this is an American slide, and there's tennis balls on the back of a Zimmer frame. All these things produce a far higher risk of dying, and this has become far more the norm. When it gets really bad these days, this is what it looks like. This punt is so sick, I can't even show you him. This is before the operation. He's hooked up to a breathing machine over here, which is working for his lungs. This is a kidney machine working for his kidneys. He's got two very concerned healthcare professionals having a fiddle with him. And here's loads of drugs making his heart better. So despite the patients that I'm doing becoming older and sicker, we're getting a bit better. How has this happened? Is it that we've become better as surgeons? Is it the operations have changed? Is it the machinery has changed? Is it the drugs are better? All those are factors. But many of us think that the biggest factor in it is without a shadow of a doubt, the realization that we have to work in teams and the best way to work in those teams. So let's just take a, a brief go through as a patient, what sort of teams you'll encounter. Well, you come into hospital and you have your operation. So you start here in theatre, you meet the theatre team. You then go to the ITU, if you've survived A. You get better, they take you off the breathing machine. You go from the ITU to the ward, where the nursing staff harry you a bit, kick you in the bottom, you walk out of hospital four or five days later. You have interacted with three teams there. Okay, of those three teams, which one do we think is the most important? Well, a lot of work has gone into this and we probably feel that the most important one is here, the theatre team, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. So, the theatre team, where do they work? Well, this is where I work, and this is, was, was where I was till about half past seven last night. This is my operating theatre. This is Theatre 30 at the University Hospital in North Staffordshire. It has got a panoply of little machines, hasn't it? This is 21st century medicine. Loads of things that go bong, loads of things that make pumping noises, loads of bits of equipment here, there and everywhere. These are irrelevant. That's the relevant thing. These are the four teams that make up the theatre team. And this, to use I think Peter's comment, is ordinary people doing extraordinary things. These are not the eight men and true of Greg's team. I can tell you that for one. One person there, that one, deep fries their fags before they smoke them. One person there, that one there, her, his idea of exercise is his wife getting in the remote control for the TV. One person here who will remain nameless, which is pretty because Vicky's quite a nice name really, 
considers healthy eating about as pleasant as a case of gentle herpes. So all in all, these are Mr. Joe Average. There's, these are nothing extraordinary, these people, but they are asked to do extraordinary things. And we get them to do extraordinary things by turning them into a team. Let me tell you about it. There are four teams here. The first team is a scrub team. These are the teams that hand me my instruments, that give me my sutures, that give me my heart valve, that will set up the artificial heart for me that I'll put into someone if things don't go so well. Here's the anaesthetic team. Now, I'm a surgeon, I always think badly of anaesthetists, and therefore I point this out. There's my anaesthetist in the back, VJ. This, you're very lucky to see him because he's a senior medical manager and he most times he's out of theatre. So, you know, this is a very, very lucky moment for me. But he's a bloody good anaesthetist. There is Mark, that's his ODP. This is the person that gets all his equipment ready, that draws up all his drugs, that will run the machinery for him while he is helping the great ship of state of the hospital in which we work. This team here is perhaps the most important team of all. These are the people that run this thing, the heart-lung machine, and this is the thing that pumps oxygenated blood around your body while I'm doing the heart operation. That's Dave there, and that's his trainee, Megan. And finally, this is the surgical team. There's me, there's Krishna, my registrar, and Heather, who is my surgical care practitioner. What have these teams got? They've got hierarchy in them. All of them have someone who is leading the team and someone who is helping in that, in that role. In that, there is, has to be career progression. You cannot just have someone doing the same thing for 25 years. It just does not work. So, let's look at this career progression. In the scrub team, Vishna here is training to become Vicky. In the perfusion team here, Megan is training to become Dave. Dave and Heather have had interesting career moves. Probably the most interesting of all is Heather. Heather started as a nurse on the ward, the final of the ward team. She then did Vishna's job as a, scrub, as a scrub runner. She became Vicky and then took about four years out to become an autonomous non-medical surgeon herself. Heather is the equivalent of what's called a physician's assistant in the United States. She's able to perform parts of the operation herself and help me doing it and help also Krishna when he's working. So, career progression. But as well as the career progression, there is constant education. And this is what binds us together as well. The education takes two forms. Obviously, if you have a trainee, there are exams they have to go through to actually become the finished article. Krishna has done multiple things to actually become, hope to become a consultant like me at the end of the day. But as well as that mandatory education, we have a constant continu continual professional development educational scheme. And this is often run by people like you, industry. And this is important because many of those people that you saw are on nearly minimum national wage. And to them, coming out to a conference like this, having some posh finger food, gives an extra value to the day that a good word from me never will. Okay. So, let's look at the team dynamics. The team dynamics of this is, can really be divided into two. Most of cardiac surgery is bloody boring. 95% of what I do is samey same, and it is that samey same which produces a reduction in your mortality. We plan for boredom. How do we plan, plan for boredom? We know that each of the teams that we run in a parallel direction, interdigitating at some point during the operation, but in a relatively autonomous fashion, every now and again communicating. Because of this, we've taken from the aerospatial industry the idea of briefing and debriefing. And this is where, in the morning, we start. So yesterday morning, I, I rock up, 8 o'clock, I say, we've got three cases to do, we know what equipment we're going to use, we know who we're going to operate on, 
Everything goes, everyone nods their heads sagely, and we get on with it. As importantly as that is at the end of the day, the debrief. So, 7, 7.30 in the evening, I turn around, how did it go today? Is there anything that we can do a little bit better? Have we learned anything today? And that's important. As well as that, it's the fact that a lot of what we do is protocolised. Now, protocolization does produce boredom to a degree. It does not make you think, oh, you know, how am I going to change the day? But what it does do in a situation like this is it allows you to feel easy with yourself and know when the unusual is going to occur. I'm proudest of all when Vicky, my scrub nurse, will turn to me and go, Christ, I hate you operating. You always do the bloody same thing. I am so bloody bored with you for two and a half hours during that last case. And that, to me, is a good thing. Because the bad things happen 5% of the time. Now, here, we have to protocolise as well. We have to practise. And this is where we have to practise for doctor turning up. This is an American concept that the bad man turns up and very bad things happen. Now, when very bad things happen, people drop dead in about 30 seconds in my game. And therefore, you have got to be on the top of your game a lot of the time. How do we deal with that? Well, we deal with it by developing a stronger and more autocratic system. As I said before, there are four teams working in parallel. But when a bad thing happens in any of those four teams, we automatically go into a default position where someone becomes the leader. Now, that leader is, by myself, the lead cardiac surgeon, the person that says where we go. Now, you've all seen Holby City. You have all seen House or whatever. You all think that when things go wrong, there's the running about of the headless chicken. Wrong. Never, ever, ever should you hear the words, oh my God, oh my God, they're bleeding out. <laughs> Nor should you hear the words, oh my God, oh my God, I'm losing him. That isn't a good one either. <laughs> and the worst one of all is oops. Never, ever, ever hear the word oops. What words do we say? Well, here's a little example. Seven months ago, I'd done an operation on someone taking a tumour out of the middle of their heart. I'd done it, completed the operation, I'd taken him off the heart-lung machine. I was leaving Krishna to shut his chest. I'd gone off to get myself a sandwich. I get called back rapidly. I pop my head into theatre with my sandwich in my mouth. And I notice a number of signs. The first sign I notice is the ceiling sign. The ceiling sign occurs when blood from the patient hits the ceiling. <laughs> That's not good. I also noticed the worst sign than that, which is the floor sign, which is when blood has hit the ceiling and then dripped down onto the floor. That's what we technically call bad. <laughs> At that point, I saw these, and I turned to Krishna, who's completing it, who had rightly pointed out to the anaesthetist that a bit of the heart had fallen off. I said, Chris, what's the problem? And he said, in true cardiac surgical fashion, there be, there's been a bit of dampness, Mr. Levine. <laughs> now, that's what we're aiming for. British understatement. <laughs> so, having told you how anecdotally we do it, can we actually turn it into protocols and guidelines? Well, yes, we can. Ten years ago, myself and one of my colleagues noted that whereas in every other form of medicine, there was protocols for what happens when you drop dead. And you can see those protocols. You can go to Waterloo Station and you will see those automatic defibrillators, which you can use to start someone up. You've seen people on TV. You've seen uh, Vinnie Jones on TV showing you how to resuscitate people you would be surprised that there was nothing like this for heart surgery. So myself and one of my mates got together and we thought up some guidelines. And these became international and now they are the benchmark for all resuscitative, uh, resuscitation after cardiac surgery throughout the whole of the UK. So then we decided to teach those guidelines. Can you uh, flash on the webpage?
No. <laughs> Okay, so this is our website. This is a cardiac surgical advanced life support course. This is Joel, my mate in the background, teaching his kids at his kids' primary school how to do a heart operation. It isn't quite that simple, but the kids did seem to be pretty enthusiastic about it. <laughs> We've rolled out these courses. We first started in the UK. We now have a number of courses we run in the US and Europe. And in four weeks' time, I'm going out to Malaysia to open our uh, Malaysian branch. OK. Can we get out of this? OK. So, what then about the leadership of such a team? I think there are, in my humble opinion, there's a number of, of sorts of leadership that I've seen in my practice. On one hand, you've got Joe Stalin. Pretty autocratic, but pretty good in a world war situation. On the other hand, you've got the EU in Strasbourg. Now, I'm a bit of a Eurosceptic, but I think, well, however European you are, you'd have to say that decision-making there is a relatively slow and circuitous manner. I'd put it to you that the big bad heart surgeon is far more towards Uncle Joe than he is ever towards the EU. And that does seem to produce a far quicker response time when things go bad. OK. I have only one business quote here. <laughs> and it comes from a very great American cardiac surgeon who will again remain nameless, which is a pity, because Denton Cooley isn't a nice name, and he was a really unpleasant human being. And it's this. There is no I in team, but there are a large number of U's in just do it. And that does seem to work when the doctor has turned up. OK, what about me? This is my uh, Greg picture, uh, one for the ladies. <laughs> Might not have the same impact. <laughs> hmm. Maybe I'm going for a different demographic, I don't know. <laughs> What about me? How do I do it? How do I lead a team that is often semi-autonomous, semi, semi but other times looks to me for direction? Well, firstly, I plan for every eventuality. The most important thing there is that basin there. When you see on Holby City or House of ER, you see doctors scrubbing up, you see them talking to each other. We don't. What I'm doing in nine five minutes when I'm scrubbing is I'm planning for every eventuality during that case. Everything that can go wrong, I'm thinking of my way round it. And that's my reflective time. That is the time when I know what I'm going to do for the next two and a half to 25 hours. Okay, second thing. What other else do, have, I, have I picked up about leadership? That, that calmness. Keep calm and just keep operating. I have noticed that if the great ship of state is going in one direction, Everybody else often follows behind you in one form or another. And I think you express some of those ideas. If you are a leader and you are leading in one direction, it's, nat it's natural for people to relatively follow you. And the final thing is my own motivation. It's the music in my head, which tells me that when half the heart has fallen off, that I can get it better. And that's a song from a group called The Shaman from 20 years ago, from the Summer of Love. And it goes, I can move, move, move any mountain. Thank you very much.